Today, for those of you that don't know, I'm a bivocational pastor. I work on Daniel Island almost every other day. And I manage about 300 acres and three swimming pools and about 12,000 residents that think I don't know what I'm doing. So, uh, over the past four weeks, <clears throat> I have been investigating and chasing down a vandal that has been doing things at two out of the three pools over the past weekends. And I've had to surveil cameras for nights on end to try to catch or apprehend this vandal. And after three weeks, last week, I finally got an identification and some distinguishing characteristics that the city of Charleston and I, uh, working together, uh, finally apprehended uh, this vandal, uh, was it, on Wednesday. But prior to that, <clears throat> it was just frustrating because every time I thought I would get close to apprehending this person, it's just going. So I just prayed and I said, God, look, this has occupied my mind for three weeks and I don't want to do this anymore. If it's your will to let this vandal go, let him stop and let it be. If it's your will to allow me to apprehend this person, then let that be, and I will show the grace of Christ as best I can and try to even witness to this person if possible. I said it that night that we apprehended the man. Uh, teenager. And so we had the opportunity to press charges or rehabilitate. And so I spoke with the father and I said, you know what? Obviously, there's a reason why this person did it. Putting them in juvenile detention is not going to solve that issue or that obstacle that this person is there. <clears throat> I want to show them the grace of Jesus Christ and let them go, but what I ask is that they come work with me for two days. So I had the opportunity to work with this young person most of the day on Friday. I don't know if this person's a believer or not, but he did hear about my own witness and my own faith and how even my own struggles with having divorced parents made me even act in some ways that this person did. And I gave him my card and I said, look, I'll see you Monday, but that's not the end of this because I want you to know that even though you might think you don't have a friend, you have a friend in me now. So I, that could have gone two different routes. I could have prosecuted, been done with it, wiped my hands out and said goodbye. That's not what God told me to do. So I just offer that as a little encouragement to you that you know you may have some vandals in your life. And the first thing you need to do is pray for them and pray that you act in a way that's godly and not ungodly. Because I have never slept better this week after Wednesday than, any, than, than the past month. So, but I welcome you back to our series in the book of Samuel, Faith in Faithless Times. As we continue our study in the book of Samuel, we've highlighted God's divine plan for a true king for all of His people through the faithfulness of ordinary people in faithless times. And as I've discussed Previously, our country's history, as well as even the world's history, there's always been this commonality among the people of their respective countries. It's their exhaustive search for a true king and settling time and time again on an earthly one who inevitably disappoints their country of leadership. There's that continuous cycle of chasing our tails to be led. But then when we're being led, we defiantly don't want to follow it. Judges 21 and 25, I'm going to rehash this every single week. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We discussed Samuel's call last week by God to become the last judge for God's chosen people. And although Samuel was just merely a teenager, he heard God's call and he answered it. And we spoke about the importance of blowing the dust off of the Bible. 
digging into the scriptures so you can hear his words come to life. Samuel also received difficult words from God to share with his mentor, the main priest, Eli, which he inevitably spoke to you, and Eli followed. But by, and even by sharing this news with Eli, God blessed Samuel's faithfulness and affirmed him and blessed his ministry so much that in 1 Samuel 3 it says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. Let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And it leads me into today's text. 1 Samuel 8. I have to admit that after reading this, I was heartbroken, flabbergasted, and terrified by the parallels of the people of God in this text and us today. So much terrified that I've asked three people within this congregation to keep their cars running just in case one of them decided they didn't want to hear it no more so I could have an easy way out if y'all started sharpening your pitchforks. That's how serious this text was. Let me be very clear. I've been so fortunate to visit many parts of this world. And despite their beauty, I've never desired to live in any other country than the United States of America. I want to, be, I want to bring that up front. But I have a much greater kingdom in heaven to come as a child of God. And it's my conviction that today's message is a warning shot across the bow of our lives to remind us that our allegiance stands before God first and foremost before any others. Our God is bigger than our country. And we need a revival soon. We need to get back to the basics and the foundations of our faith that God Himself and Jesus Himself taught. It leads me into today's text in 1 Samuel which is in the first part of the Old Testament, right after the book of Ruth. And since this text is so large, I'm going to be breaking it up in pieces throughout this sermon. So I'd ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 8 and start with me in verse 1, and we'll also have them on the screen. <clears throat> when Samuel became old, <clears throat> he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, the name of his second, Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba. Yet, his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Now, if any of you have been a part of this series in 1 Samuel from the beginning, these first three verses sound like a repeat of the priest Eli and his sons Hophni and Phinehas who were equally wicked before God. Thank you very much. I love the help. <clears throat> Eli's inability to lead his sons was God's decision to call Samuel to become the last judge of the people. And now we fast track to Samuel as the old man with two sons who do not walk in God's ways. Now, according to the world standards of succession, princes and princesses become as good or worse as their parents. Pastors' children who follow the call will become as good or worse as their father. Nepotism is the norm here. But it's contrary to God's call. And despite the godliness of any leader, there is no guarantee in their ability to avoid sin, 
nor the godliness gene being passed on to their offspring. It brings me to our first sermon. None is righteous. No, not one. None is righteous. No, not one. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12 says, As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. <clears throat> no one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Samuel was chosen by God to judge Israel all the days of his life. But he wasn't a perfect man either. He gave his sons opportunities to follow in his call. But they took advantage of their father's name to pervert justice. They took bribes for crying out loud. <coughs> As leaders of the faith. Thank God that doesn't happen anymore, right? The elders and most of Israel knew about Eli's Samuel's sons being so disrupt and perverted and wicked people. How could Samuel not know about this? Number one, as their father. Number two, their boss. Throughout the scripture, we see time and again the failings of people. Yet God sovereignly weaves his hand throughout that chaos to bring peace. In the history of of the world, there has only been one person that has lived a righteous life and we crucify him. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For our sake, He, Jesus, God, made Him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Did you hear that? For our sake. Do you understand that? Let me remind you again from Romans. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. They have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. That's everybody in here, by the way. No one. Including me. We are incapable of doing good. Do you understand that? We are incapable of doing good because we are inherently evil people. We might dress nice and talk nice and do all the smooth things, but deep down inside there is this sin that makes us evil. Yet, we have our tolerance li limits on how much evil that we can allow in our lives and even in our country. Franklin Graham, who I respect immensely, was quoted recently about his support for our president. He said, in my lifetime, he has supported the Christian faith more than any other president that I know. That doesn't mean he's the greatest example of the Christian faith, and neither am I, but he defends the faith. There's a difference between defending the faith and living the faith. Is there really a difference? James, Jesus' brother says, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. They go hand in hand. It's not or... Jesus goes on to say in that first chapter of chapter 2, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. No partiality. He goes on in that chapter to condemn people who show favor to a rich person compared to a poor person. 
It's no different in America. Our sinful desires to protect America over proclaiming God's kingdom will be our demise. Our faith is not a political party. Our faith is not a political party. It represents a kingdom of every tribe, tongue, and nation through the power and sacrifice of Jesus Christ alone. Not our founding fathers, not past presidents, and even our current president. In Christ alone. We must repent of our sinfulness of country over kingdom. All of us, we're all guilty of this. <coughs> Begin seeking His kingdom to come. Leads me to your next sermon. Seek a distinct kingdom to serve. Seek a distinct kingdom to serve. Here, First Samuel verses four through six. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, "Behold, you are old." Slap him in the face for saying that. <laughs> and your sons do not walk in your ways. I might agree with him. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So in our minds, and based on our democracy, this is obvious. Our group of Leaders that want to get rid of a bad one. Country has a bunch of devious people in power, so let's just find some replacements. The issue lies in their ideals for that. Appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations, like everybody else. We want to look like the other nations with a, with a king, so give us that. Grass is always greener over there. So let's replicate it. The nation of Israel was never chosen to be similar to the nations. Genesis 12 says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Not just the Hebrew people, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven will be great, will be blessed, and will bless all the families of the earth. They would be blessed because God was their king, not Abram, Abraham, you name it. The elders needed God, not an earthly king. America and the world need God, not a king, not a queen, or a president. We need God as our king. Jerry Falwell Jr. And defending the president said this. There are two kingdoms. There's the earthly kingdom and the heavenly kingdom. And in the heavenly kingdom, the responsibility is to treat others as you like to be treated. In the earthly kingdom, the responsibility is to choose leaders who will do what's best for your country. Jesus says in Matthew 6, For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. In the Lord's Prayer, we speak, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our responsibility isn't to just choose leaders who will do what's best for our country, but seek God's presence and hand within this country for His will to be done. 
America should not be revered as the greatest country of the world, but as Jesus taught, as the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We must repent of our human dependence on other people. Pray for God's counsel for this country and the world. Not God bless America. God bless this world. It is your kingdom to come. We must exhaust our energy in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed with our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, our family, our strangers, and even our opponents every day. Our singular focus in salvation through Jesus Christ for all will bring liberty and justice for all for eternity. <clears throat> Just as in biblical times, God is sovereignly watching us. And He's watching His people. And we must return to Him. This leads me to our final sermon we get what we pray for. We get what we pray for. This is a very long, but I want you to listen carefully and hear the parallels in what they were going through and today. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and Samuel, the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you. They have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they also do it to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. And so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from them. This is the part you need to listen carefully. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He'll take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He'll take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you'll cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice, make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. When I read this text, I cry. I'm humbled by God's prophetic words for us today. Verses 11 through 12 should strike a chord with the formation of an army through the selection of sons for service. This isn't any different than the selective service or draft that exists within America today. Verses 14 through 17. He'll take the best of your fields and vineyards. He'll take the tenth of your grain and your vineyards. He'll take your male servants and female servants and the best of the best. He'll take a tenth of your flocks. The king will take the best. He will take a tip. Does any of that sound like eminent domain to you? If it doesn't sound like eminent 
domain. How about paying a tent sounding a lot like that? <laughs> it's funny, but it's not. What about the amount of taxes withheld from your paychecks on a regular basis? When we see these amounts taken out, we proclaim verse 18. And in that day you'll cry out because of your king, whom you've chosen for yourselves. The Lord will not answer you in that day. We get what we pray for. <coughs> Let me be clear. Let's see, pastoral side note. I am not condoning not registering for selective service. I had to. I'm not condoning not paying taxes on a religious basis. Jesus says, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Be the IRS coming up and saying, well, you told these people not to pay taxes. I need that. But I am convicted that we have gotten our priorities of this life all jacked up. The Lord is speaking to us in verse 7. For they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. We have rejected God in being king over us in our personal lives, in our country, and in this world. And as a group of people, we are proclaiming to be His church. We must repent of our apathy in seeking God's will for our families' lives. We must repent of arbitrating our faith to presidents, governors, mayors, senators, congresspeople, and judges. We must repent of our outright laziness in showing the in sharing the most profound gift in all the world with every man, woman, and child within our reach. If we seek God's kingdom to be reflected in America today, we must live it out in our homes first. If we seek God's kingdom to be reflected in America today, we must share it in the same way that Jesus shared it with His disciples, the Pharisees, the woman at the well, and even Saul on the road to Damascus. God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven starts right here at Seaweed Bay. We must confront our sins together. Because no one is righteous, not even one. We must be open about our struggles with each other so we can surround ourselves with prayer to God for His protection and most importantly, His victory. <coughs> you want prayer in schools? Teach your kids to pray. Teach your kids to pray. You want the Bible back in schools and in government and other in your workplace? Take your Bible with you. <coughs> we are called to be a light of the world, not just on Sundays. If you want to reflect His kingdom and you want God to reclaim America as His country, then we have to start living it. And praying for His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And also understand that this is His country. This is His world. It's not God bless America and nobody else. It's God bless us. I pray for the Iranians who only know Muhammad or Allah. I pray for the Indians with their multiple gods that they pray and not one is Jesus. Well, they pray for Jesus, but that's one of thousands. Even in our rural backyard here, there are people who don't even know Jesus Christ yet. And those are the ones we should meet first. Are you willing to just continue down that road of 
voting for a conservative agenda so you can get a Supreme Court that has conservative values that will vote your way? Are you willing to really start making a difference and start teaching those values to your children and your children's children and their friends and making an impact right here in Allendale, McClellanville, Seaweed, DeSanti? Because that's what God's called you to do. We can't arbitrate our faith anymore. Because we'll be called to judgment for that. You don't have an answer for it. I want to encourage each and every one of you that I'm not un-American. I love this place. There's no other place I'd rather be, but I love His kingdom more. And I want people to know that as much as they embrace that American flag, that the cross is more important. our responsibility. We are the caretakers of this country that we live in right now, so we have that responsibility to carry the light of the world for God and His kingdom in America and beyond. Are you ready to carry the torch?